All right. Well, I am just uh, thrilled to have such an amazing group of panelists here today. And um, you'll notice that these aren't the people that are normally talking about libraries. Um, uh, I mean, obviously you have at some point, but we wanted to bring together people that could really speak about some of the human capital challenges facing the city, people that are working with uh, populations that, that I think are affected by uh, the skills gap and, and the human capital challenges New York is facing. And uh, let me just quickly, you all have bios of all of them in your packet, but let me just quickly introduce uh, Commissioner Fatima Shama, uh, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, uh, Kathy Wild, of course the President and CEO of the Partnership for New York City, Sandra Escamilla, uh, the Executive Director of the Youth Development Institute, Sheena Wright, who's the President and CEO of United Way of New York City, and Chris Lawrence, who's the Senior Director of the Mozilla Mentor Community and Director of the Hive Learning Network of New York City. And so let me just toss it out, and, and, and maybe we'll start with you, Commissioner. Um, you know, to what extent is the city facing a, a human capital gap. You, for instance, obviously work with a lot of immigrant populations in this city uh, when it comes to language abilities or other things. Um, is there a challenge that New York faces in the years ahead? And what's the role of the libraries in addressing this? Um, so first, good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and to my colleagues on the panel, good morning. Um, so I think, you know, I, as I've shared with each of the library presidents that are here, libraries play such a critical role in our um, communities in general. Certainly for me, growing up um, in the Bronx, um, the library was my after school and summer camp altogether, um, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and I think it actually is very much, um, largely David, by your, your image, the fact that it's present everywhere um, really provides tremendous accessibility. For um, immigrant New Yorkers, where New York City's 8.4 population, 60% of New York City's population are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And so from a human capital perspective, um, we're looking at, certainly from that, that youth population, the future. Um, and for that parent population, a c considerable audience that we can continue to cultivate, continue to help foster their entrepreneurial desires, continue to help connect them to English language programs so that we can see their economic ability just thrive beyond um, imagination. And so um, as libraries are absolutely physical structures that are placed in our communities, there's lots of opportunity to think about um, ways to, um, as, as sort of was shared, but program um, in a way that allows individuals to continue, right? The, the reality of, I think, college prep, of, of young people who are first-time college students who need to apply to college. Where do they go to fill out their financial aid forms? Where do they go to get mentorship on that essay that they have probably never known how to write before? How do their parents engage in that process without knowing, right? That is very much, if for, if for immigrant households or for our city, the reality of college, a college degree is that valuable, we've got to figure out a, p a pathway and an opportunity to connect them to those resources. And I think with neighborhood-based entities that are ripe for that opportunity, that seems like um, it is, it doesn't seem like it is a great way to have um, libraries continue to be that. Um, and just quickly to follow up, I mean, you really go all around the city, every corner of the city. Um, are you seeing immigrants and, and immigrant communities um, use the libraries? Um, so. I'm a huge fan of our libraries, and I think, I mean, as, as each of these folks would know, I, my office does a tremendous amount of work with, with each of the library systems. We um, really know that libraries are safe space. We know that um, unlike many buildings, libraries do not ask for any form of ID to enter, so anyone can walk in. Um, it is, in fact, a place where um, libraries themselves have demonstrated um, opportunity for families to come and gather, so there's a place for children and a place for adults. Uh, and the programming has been exceptional all over, all over the city. And so in my mind, libraries very much serve as that place where immigrants go. Um, it's where my mother went. Um, it's where many um, immigrant households continue to go today. Um, and I think there's so much more, whether it's on the small business, entrepreneurial perspective, on the computer literacy perspective, on the English as a second language, as we see our resources dwindle and the growth in people wanting to learn more um, and sort of have the conversational skills, as the debate of comprehensive immigration reform gets, um, gets discussed in the halls of Congress, um, English is a reality and it will be a reality. And um, for that generation like myself that's born and raised here, 
we sort of know how to navigate and use English. How do we navigate the rest of the systems becomes a greater question. But for my parents, right, English was very critical for them. And libraries are very safe spaces where people go to get those resources. Thank you. Kathy, you, you've been pretty outspoken about kind of how important human capital is to New York City's economic competitiveness. I mean, do we still have some work to, to be done in terms of bringing up uh, the, the, the local homegrown population? And, and what's the role of libraries? Uh, well, it was interesting because I hadn't thought much about the role of libraries in this regard. But my friend Scott Corwin has done some consulting work for the libraries from Booz and Company. And in checking, uh, checking in with him, um, he suggested that increasingly libraries are a very important way of connecting uh, people to the job market and to the education and training required for the job market. And that, uh, thinking about that, in uh, January of this year, the uh, online job listings openings in New York City were 190,000. Mm -hmm. And when you consider we still have very high unemployment uh, post-recession, the fact that there are that many openings is an illustration of the skills mismatch in the city. If you talk to a entrepreneur in a young internet company where so many of the new jobs and the economic growth is coming from, the first thing they'll say is New York City is not producing the talent that we need. Uh, basically, mid-level computer science, technology, they're not looking for PhD engineers. They're looking for the nuts and bolts programmers, and they're not finding them. So the, uh, the idea of the library is at a connecting point. I was interested in your report, the connection to the Workforce One centers, the city's job placement centers, which is important. I think what's missing is with both most of the Workforce One centers and um, the uh, community college system is a real strong connection to the business community to industry interests. That there's still, we still don't have a very well integrated system. There are some great examples of efforts in workforce development, um, but, some, uh, but not really an integrated system if you look at where Germany, at Washington State, at Australia, at places that really have their act together in terms of preparing people for the new workforce. It's not happening. And perhaps the library can be a locus for that initiative. Thanks, Kathy. Sandra, uh, you work with a lot of young people, young adults in New York. Um, you know, are, is the library a place that, that they are going to, and, and how do they fit into all this? Um, I mean, one of the things I want to do is step back for a second. I feel like the standards for young people in New York City have really, uh, they've gone up, and so that there are many efforts to uh, include more rigorous instruction with the integration of the Common Core now through K to 12, and now the uh, kind of moving from the GED to the uh, high school equivalency test that will really be aligned with the Common Core and will be computer-based, as well as the city, uh, CUNY, CUNY and DOE's efforts to really double the graduation rates uh, of people going into college and succeeding by 2020. I mean, that's ambitious, right, doubling, considering some of the statistics that you mentioned earlier. And yet, what we, what we know in some of the youth-serving organizations that we work with, that some young people have a longer ro way to go and that they have less capacity uh, in terms of skills, specific, specifically literacy and work-based, to get there. And yet, there's an acceleration or, or a need for them to um, be prepared in a time that is unreasonable, right? So when I think about that, I think specifically of disconnected youth or young people that are considered to be at the margins that are really reading between fourth and eighth grade reading levels and that are also not in the world of work. They're not working, they're not engaged in schools. And so I think that the library really offers opportunities for those young people to really accelerate their learning, right, through pre-GED programs, but not necessarily stopping there because I think that's where we fall short. It's about kind of thinking about the pathways for disconnected youth from pre-GED to GED and for post-secondary credentialing opportunities, which could be kind of preparing them for college, to persist and succeed in college, as well as in the world of work. Um, and I think that that requires some really reimagining on how we engage specifically this population that is not considered to be seen as an asset in New York City, that's really considered to be a problem to be fixed. But many of them who are entering uh, libraries are even kind of 
uh, trying to connect with community-based organizations have demonstrated an enormous amount of resiliency because they often face multiple barriers. So I think that literacy or kind of work-based skills is just one barrier, but also kind of thinking about how libraries support them in, in kind of removing some of the barriers that impede learning and also offering opportunities for them to have safe havens, right? Um, a lot of young people are not kind of, that are disconnected are not, they're displaced from their communities and the fact that there's so many libraries in their communities, it's kind of inviting them in and really making it a youth-friendly environment where young people can feel like they belong, but not necessarily in just room 303, but that it's a culture that invites and uses these young people as assets. Thank you. Sheena, um, you know, now with United Way, but also previously with Abyssinian Development Corporation, I'm curious, what's, what's your perspective on this? Well, certainly, um, Listening to all my colleagues up here, agreeing wholeheartedly with what has been said, um, libraries, uh, you know, my framework is from a kind of community development perspective and how communities come together. And certainly in Harlem and in other communities, libraries are certainly the place where people come together. So whether it's race, class, age, you know, there are programs for seniors, and particularly in gentrifying communities, it, it really does become this place where people break out of their silos and can come together in a common space and build community in a very significant way that's not really present in other places in a neighborhood in, in New York City. So I would say the two places I think that disparate people come together are playgrounds. If you have little kids, you all come together in communities and, and libraries. Um, so that's a very important piece as well. In terms of um, the, the skills gap, one of the things certainly that Kathy said was that there were 190,000 online jobs. One of the things that we found when the firefighter exam was reopened and, you know, through the, the case, there was a lawsuit against the fire department that said that uh, their practices were discriminatory, they had to have more of a, a, of a balance, more people of color and they, there was the opportunity to apply to be a firefighter. You had to apply online. That you couldn't go in there, you know, years ago you could do a paper form and people did not have computers in their homes in communities like Harlem across the city. And every single day there's a line down the block around the corner on some of the key, in some of the key libraries for that 45 minute block of library time. So access to technology is hugely important. You can't even get to the job market without access to a computer. So it's, it's a vital, vital, vital resource uh, certainly in that regard. I think one of the things um, certainly that was talked about this morning was the funding and the resources. And what is really challenging is that there hasn't been a real advocacy campaign for the library system. If people try to close a firehouse, right, you hear about on the news, people are stomping their feet. I mean, there, there are natural coalitions around other community assets but we haven't done that for our library system and hopefully this report will really bring to the level what people really know about the libraries and how important they are to community and be a, a galvanizing point to organize and advocate for the appropriate resources that we need for this very, very important community resource. And that, that was one of the things that really struck me, just the decrease in funding, the increase in, in um, use, the, unbelievable utility and that there is there isn't a voice that's saying this is important and this is needed and we need to have uh, appropriate resources allocated to it so I think that's an exciting opportunity for the future that's a great point and also um, what you and Kathy were both saying about kind of the jobs and, and applying online one of the things that was striking uh, I found in the course of our research was that we were told that something like 80 or 90 percent of all of the jobs today require an online application. Mm. Even for, for many, if not most, retail jobs right. today, you actually have to apply online and, and you're right that a lot of people don't have a uh, broadband connection at home or, or maybe not even a computer. So, um, Chris, um, um, you know, you're working with the libraries in some capacity with the Hive uh, network. Um, but I'm curious, when people talk about the human capital challenges, obviously, you know, um, the first thought is often with the public schools mm -hmm. and clearly there's been an effort in, in the last decade to, to improve uh, the public schools, to do, to do school reform. Um, that's clearly important. Uh, the workforce development system clearly is important. Uh, but do, do the libraries also play a role? Is there something that we need more than the schools 
uh, to really address some of the human capital gaps out there? Um, yes. <laughs> um, so I think being last, you get the sort of benefit of kind of having the domino of everyone's super insightful thoughts. And and one thing that strikes me is we that we talk about you know doubling well you know doubling down on rigor you know probably is is meaning that we're we're tripling down on siphoning out a whole sections of people that that's not going to be relevant for or useful for. So I think what the libraries do, and, and actually as three main branches, or three main libraries in New York are all hubs of the Hive Learning Network, um, and in, in some way built on a library model of, of um, engagement, is where are we offering these kind of opportunities that don't look like school, that don't look like even career development, even though that might be some of our end goals as well. So an educated populace and a, and a career ready workforce are things we're interested in as well, but we think there's, uh, there's alternate paths there um, that can sometimes support school but are, are outside of school or, or in adjacent to school as well. And I think that's things that the library really is, is well positioned to do. So I think working within the confines of youth culture and, and speaking the languages that, that you speak, and, and I'm not speaking of traditional languages, I'm speaking about youth cultural languages and things of that nature, the libraries have that openness, and what I, coming to the Hive work from work in New York City Culturals, what I experienced when I was more home-based in Culturals was whenever we would go for grants or look for funding or look to expand our work um, was always, what are you doing to support school? What are you doing to support standards? How are you standard standardizing your practice? And I was just like, well, let's just close up shop then, because it we can't, all of these sectors can't be doubling down on school and doubling down on rigor. And um, so I think there's a real opportunity to let learning that looks, smells, and tastes different breathe in places like libraries. Mm -hmm. And that we hope to do in, in the Hive Network is not only is have libraries and other culturals and, and youth serving organizations think of themselves as an ecosystem as well and a network so that th there can be more collaboration and, and for these youth or their parents or other sectors of of, of engaged stakeholders, they see more explicit pathways between these kinds of resources. And they're not just siloed at their branch, um, but they might, be, they might see that an experience at this branch might push them to a collaboration with a place like Global Kids, um, a youth serving organization, um, or, or they enter a project through Hive that's got a, a multitude of organizations involved and they start to see the breadth of opportunities that are, are existing to them most of which probably speak their language in, in a different way than, than school does or, or some kind of, of career prep. Which, um, and we'd love to work with those as well, but I do think it's a place, there's a free choice, informal environment that the libraries and similar institutions can't let go of as a real uh, you know, differentiator. Sandra, I'm curious, when, when it comes to a lot of the youth that you work with, um, I mean, what, what are the kind of strengths and weaknesses of libraries right now? Are, are a lot of young people, young adults going to libraries? Are there things that libraries need to do better to, whether it's outreach or different kinds of programs, are they, are they appealing uh, to, to young people in the way that Chris describes? Yeah. I think for the most part when I think about other entities that are in communities that are very responsive to youth needs, I think about the beacons in New York City. They're 80, uh, in New York City and there are some throughout the country that are really responsive to youth needs because they engage them on multiple levels, right? So while I think the library has been very skilled in engaging young people in various different types of programs, I think it varies in relationship to them being able to really provide really intentional ladders of leadership to young people throughout kind of their duration so that young people come in, uh, when I think about kind of the Beacons model, they come in as recipients of services, similarly like through the, the K through 5, libraries also do that, but then in middle school, and there's a lot of, as you know, uh, kind of correlation between retention and after school programs on cultural institutions and, in, in, and high graduation rates, high school graduation rates, so thinking about the libraries and how do they utilize middle school youth specifically during that transition stage to really engage them in mentorship opportunities to younger, uh, younger participants and then transitioning to high school where they really begin to be partners in the programming and really beginning to kind of assess the needs of the community and do community benefit projects that will allow them to really be contributors and seen, seen as assets to the library and, and ultimately to the community. So I, I think that um, some of the libraries that we work with uh, currently um, provide kind of internships to young people and they are kind of one of the biggest workforce for young people through SYAP. 
But I, I also feel that these intentional rungs that really use young people as assets and then really allow for community youth development to occur is really critical. But I think that there's some challenges uh, because some of the young people that are um, that are kind of recipients of services are not always viewed as assets, right? So we know we live sometimes in an adultist community where young people aren't, uh, are seen more as problems to be fixed rather than assets and contra contributors. I think it's about figuring out, in addition to the content knowledge that libraries have, and many libraries do this, figuring out how they are engage young people and retain them. So I know that the kind of the usage of young people in your report demonstrates a, a significant increase, but thinking about retaining them over time, right? So I remember visiting the library in elementary school and then in middle school and high school I fell off. So thinking about what are the things that need to be in place in order for young people to thrive. And some of the research shows that it's kind of engaging opportunities and opportunities for them to contribute into the culture of the organization. Kathy, did you have a comment or no? Mm -hmm. uh, well, Kathy, you mentioned earlier about the kind of uh, lack of engagement right now with the business community. And um, obviously, um, if there is a skills mismatch out there and you want to make sure that if libraries have a role in skills building, um, wh how do you bridge that? How do you make sure that, that businesses get, get more involved and, and, and help libraries understand what the skills that are most needed? Well, I guess I'd approach that from two angles. One, there's this whole notion today that people are talking about in terms of collective impact and how can we do a better job of integrating <laughs> the flows of funding and services into neighborhoods so that they're both more efficient and, um, and uh, more effective. And I think that um, clearly the education and healthcare networks of services are the most robust in terms of financing and will probably remain so. So I think the library system has to be plugged in. Uh, and I think the, uh, the access to technology for those that don't have it and the access to the possibilities of the job market um, are both important factors. On the fiscal front, the city in 2014 is projected to have a $2.4 billion deficit, structural, the consequence of a structural budget deficit that doesn't include the cuts that are anticipated in federal funding which represents 15% of our GDP, and those cuts are, are going to be significant for New York City. Um, and it doesn't include whatever negotiation is made with the city's unions for their new contracts. So you start with $2.4 in deficits, and it gets worse. And as we all know, every year, libraries are among the first to go. And then they get restored by the city council because of their neighborhood base. But I think looking at the map of the geographic locations of all the libraries, I mean, all you have to do is look at that map and you see massive investment in capital and administration that could clearly be a little more efficiently organized. And I, I was interested in the model of the, the Bronx Library Center where you've got tremendous utilization. It doesn't seem to have cut down on utilization, but you've also got enormous efficiencies of scale and the ability to provide to provide better services, better, better access to technology. I just think that's a model that the library system is going to have to look at. So it, it would be both in terms of um, some centralization and efficiencies in service, and number two, plugging in with the health and education system to what is the library's role in that, um, in those areas where the funding streams are, law, are large, vigorous, and will probably remain so. Thanks. Sheena? And, and just just to, to the point, the two points that were just made, you know, I don't know if the library system has to develop more programming as much as really start to coalesce some of the existing programs and services in its facility. These are really great kind of capital infrastructure. They have uh, the technology that's needed. And if they were open a couple more hours, those really high quality youth serving organizations that don't have the space to serve all the kids that they can serve or the workforce development program, I mean, th that would be a tremendous asset in and of itself. So as opposed to kind of layering on more responsibilities and programs that maybe some libraries are not 
equipped to take on, there are existing programs and services in neighborhoods and communities, and how are we leveraging the resources that the libraries do have without them having to expand and add to, to their budgets in significant ways from a programming perspective when they do have some significant assets that others can use, I think, are things that we should look at as we're mapping and really trying to organize communities to be more efficient and effective. I guess what I was asking is, can the libraries afford to be a capital resource? Mm -hmm. Right now, I don't think they really can. Right. And that's a question in terms of looking at the reorganization of our overall service delivery system. Right. But I think it's, um, you know, all you have to do is look at that map and see that they have a tough challenge. And if a program doesn't pay for itself, mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult to open the library. Well, I, I have a couple of questions that come from that. One for, for Sheena, actually, since you mentioned some of the kind of lack of advocacy and you compared it to the fire, fire uh, closings, uh, firehouse closings, um, you know, what, what would you suggest the libraries do? Or how do you get, you know, groups like Abyssinian or, or community-based organizations that understand the importance of libraries in their communities uh, to, to kind of come out and actually be advocates for libraries? Maybe they already are. Um, but is there, is there, what, what piece is missing to, to get to that level of advocacy that you, you mentioned? Well, I think one of the things is certainly awareness. <clears throat> so, I mean, this report goes a long way, I think, in helping communities appreciate and understand what the challenges are and, and what uh, some of the proposed solutions need to be. So I think that's one thing. And then what you start to think about what are the natural groups that would advocate. Seniors are very powerful advocates uh, in communities, and they coalesce, and they use the libraries, I mean, significantly. Um, parents also, a powerful advocacy group for their children. So there are natural um, advocates for libraries, I think, armed with the information. We can, they can kind of get some things done, and certainly, you know, to Kathy's point, I agree that, that the expense of keeping a building open and having the custodians you know, work over time and all the union um, pressures is significant. But there are programs that do pay for themselves. And so, you know, as, as we, we were looking, you know, we have a workforce development, we had a workforce development program in Abyssinia that had a part of its grant to pay rent. And you could, um, so some of the schools stay open because some of the programs that use it can pay the extra insurance and security. So as we kind of connect some of those resources together, maybe that can be helpful. So I don't, I don't even know if the library system is, is open to that type of exploration in the way that school buildings are. Mm -hmm. and, and so New York City school buildings have all types of programs running in them, and those programs pay for that extra time. And if we could kind of spread that around, um, that, that would be significant. But there are, I think, definitely natural groups of people that would come together and say, you know, we need our library. We need to figure this out. Uh, we, we need it open longer. We need more programming or services. And, and so this report goes a long way. Thanks. I, I want to actually um, touch upon some of the things that Sheen has mentioned. So I think there actually are advocates for libraries. I, I do think the question is, um, forgive me, but who screams louder? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that when parents are advocating for um, their children, I think we've got to realize that how much does a person, how much can a person do? And so when seniors are demanding for more senior centers and when parents are demanding for more issues or, or, or um, support in schools, it really becomes where can we, um, whose voice, or where do I actually, you know, what, where do I put my eggs, if you will, um, in which basket? And so that's one. Two is I think actually there are people who advocate for libraries, and I would say that without, you know, um, a unionized workforce or a unionized audience, it makes it much more complicated. And so I actually think I'm much more interested in sort of the partnership opportunity, and in fact thinking about. Um, the reality that you do have these physical infrastructures and in communities and um, family literacy is something that is very critical for our for for many for any family certainly as we think about the reality of UPK right how do we start families in an environment and leverage the costs of what can happen from federal dollars enrolling family in a UPK program right you have physical presence of people in a space 
We've seen too many seats unfilled in our school system for universal pre-K. How do we actually enroll people while they're there? How do we take them on this sort of journey, right, for middle school, very critical years? How do we help families understand what's happening? How do we help make sure young people understand? I know I go to libraries and sometimes I have three sons, um, and they're noisy. Right? And so we've got to reframe what a library is. In many ways, I think it's a place where kids can be um, themselves, and it's a community center as much as it is a place of learning. And so I think, to your point, I think the report talks about um, physical infrastructure and how do we change those things. And I think as many of us, the collective we, the New Yorkers, utilize libraries in different ways, I think that's when we can do um, creative ways of, of advocacy. But I think to assume that there is an, a, an audience that's advocating, I, I don't know if I think that's right. I think there are, whether they're loud enough, um, I think could be discussed. But it is a matter, not just of being loud, there are gonna be real public policy sure. choices that have sure. to be made. So you have right. to have a rational policy argument for how this fits into the bigger picture, how the library and its funding fits into the bigger picture. Well, one of the things I, I'm curious about, and, and maybe this is just me, I, I get the sense that, that a lot of people in this city don't perceive libraries as part of the educational infrastructure. I mean, if New York City does have these human capital issues to, to, to solve over the next 10, 15, 20 years, and libraries with the schools, with the workforce development system may be part of that, um, is, I mean, is, I mean if, they're, if they're framed that way, do you find it easier to get political support for them? Um. Or maybe they are already. Well, I don't know about way. political support, the substantive support, of course, because the that is the challenge of our decade for so many of the young people in the city. They, I, I think everybody saw the numbers. 78% um, of the high school graduates of the public school system require remedial yes. training when they go to community college. Mm -hmm. And when you think that only 28% of the kids in high school even graduate, you're really talking about a very uh, small number of kids that are well prepared for the workforce, and which goes to the other point in terms of the jobs unfilled, in, uh, even in the, in the healthcare sector, which has long been a primary entree to the middle class today without proper certifications and training. A healthcare job is not an entry level job. It really requires um, at, at some kind of skills-based training. So I think how the libraries fit into that structure is unclear. New York City in general, the whole country um, actually has been slow on really focusing on what's required for workforce preparation in the 21st century and how it's, it's not a liberal arts degree in many cases, it's something uh, much more, with much more technical math, uh, STEM training. Um, I don't think of the libraries in that context. I think of the libraries in a much more traditional liberal arts context. So maybe that's part of the messaging that has to go on as to the role of libraries in the 21st century economy. Chris? So I think the work that we're doing in Hive with all three libraries as key pieces is addressing some of that, and I will admit and, hop and sort of cop to on the edges at this point. You know, it's entrepreneurial in nature, and it's not systemic, but it is positioning in a collectivist ecosystem way the libraries as part of a, of a network of people that are really creating what I sometimes call innovation garages amongst New York City culturals and youth organizations, where some of that stuff is starting to happen about how you actually can create these kinds of shops in, in the network that land sometimes in off hours, places in the library, driven by three or four different sort of intellectual partners within the network, but they're looking at some of those exact same issues around how the workforce is changing. So whether that is hard skills in STEM, um, you know, so why not 3D printers and make shops and hack shops in libraries and things like that. Um, to also sort of that entrepreneurial spirit that can be incubated in these kinds of spaces that is not going to be available to, to youth in schools. And so the, the, we're trying on the edges to sort of seed all of those ways that are respons responsive more to a 21st century workforce. And then one of our, um, not just Hive, but along with our, our partners at MacArthur and Mozilla and, and others, you know, are what are assessments that actually start to marker that. We, some, we call them badges, badges for learning or badges for assessment. So you can imagine 
a 17-year-old that might go through a couple of high programs. It might be 3D printing or might be computer science or might be uh, uh, social justice campaigns in their neighborhood. How does that start to get accredited through an assessment with badges that have then metadata tagged on them that go back to whatever assessment rubric um, by program that gave them? So, and if you look at the tech sector now, those kind of, in the, in the coding worlds, whether it's something like a top coder or something where that, they've already went to that kind of system, the Googles of the world, you know, get much more data from both the hard and soft skills that are, that are badged in those environments than they do from degrees. So, in some ways, how are we legitimizing the experiences that go on in libraries, in programs, in places like Hive, that, that they come out of that with some kind of a accreditation that might start to tap those skills, which in reality large swaths of the workforce need, want, and aren't getting. And where I think we can actually, you know, I think we have a city of youth that actually have those hard and soft skills there that we're not, we're not leveling up. Well, let me uh, follow that up by, by kind of saying what's next for libraries? We've talked a little bit about what advocacy needs to happen or what the city could possibly be doing with funding, but when it comes to libraries themselves trying to tap into this kind of changing economy, the need for innovation skills and, and coding and other things, let's start with Chris again. Just like what, what more should libraries be doing? You said, again, you're kind of on the edge of this right now with Hive and, and a, a fairly small number of libraries, but, but what, what more can libraries be doing to reposition themselves in this way? Well, I actually have to, so I think libraries are actually fairly rapid in their response to some of this. So I don't, I like to frame it as not a deficit model with libraries. I actually think libraries are, and many of the traditional institutions in society are, are more on the bleeding edge than not. So I, I want to preface that. But, um, you know, I think, I think it's just an expanded definition of literacies, which is, I think, a, you know, which is where libraries live, you know, literacy. And, you know, whether that's, you know, media, digital, web, I mean, there's all, all of these kind of languages that the 21st century is going to need, you know, whether, and, and just from straight sort of decoding the kind of world we live in to actually recoding the world that we live in. And I think, I, I think an embracement, is that a word? Um, <laughs> an embracing of, uh, as I speak about literacies. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think there's an expanded set of, of knowledge and of literacies that we need, and then the expertise within the libraries that understand those literacies would be a, a pretty substantial start. And it's already happening. Great. Anybody else on the panel as far as just kind of, you know, what libraries themselves need to be doing to kind of, um, you know, em embrace a and, and take on some of these challenges? Uh, what, what more do libraries need to be doing? I mean, I think the, the example of the Workforce One centers in the, um, in the um, report and that reality is a really great one in terms of recognizing, one, physical infrastructure, but the fact that the city has needs to um, communicate any number of policies into communities. I think of our Office of Financial Empowerment and the fact that we've um, fostered financial empowerment centers in community-based providers across the city. I think libraries could very well be that place. Um, so there's a, an, an addition of a funding stream that can help leverage um, and add additional human capital into that space, but it's really providing a service. I think actually of, um, um, along the SBS line, business solution centers, right? We have business solution centers. Jackson Heights is a great example. Jackson Heights is an amazing community of small business owners. There actually isn't a business solution center in the Jackson Heights community. Could uh, the Jackson Heights branch become a satellite site where some additional funding gets pumped in to help some of those, those small business owners think a little bit about um, how to start a business, how to grow a business, right? We know that immigrant small business owners make up half of New York City small business population, but we also know that their businesses fail within the first year, right? The highest number of businesses fail. Um, to immigrant small business owners. I think of, again, I'll mention the education space, right? Whether it's around middle school or additional um, homework help that has to happen, um, or that, that population of early literacy, that early education, which we know to be the most critical um, formative years of a, of a child. Um, first time home buyership, first, um, so HPD and the opportunity for HPD to leverage hospital presence in giving workshops around home ownership. I mean, I think there's lots of partnerships that the city can engage in with, you know, these entities that are um, very neighborhood based, um, but we're, we've got the funding and we have needs to reach the population and you actually can help us do that. So. Great. Sheena, did you have a comment? Yeah, I mean, I think these are all, you know, fantastic ideas, and I think that the innovation is happening kind of library by library, neighborhood by neighborhood, so you can go into one library, and it can be this really fantastic hub, and all these things are going, around, going on, and my three sons can run around and <laughs> kind of be themselves and be engaged, and you can go to another library, and it's, shh, 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> sit down, you know, this is, this is th that kind of space. So I'm not sure how, as a system, the library sets the strategic priorities and goals and says these are the, you know, we want to be connected uh, or, or seen as real partners in the workforce space, or we want to make sure that mm -hmm. we're connected to the other service providers in our neighborhoods. And, and that edict coming from the system um, to all libraries to really be thoughtful about this. You know, because also in the report, there were some instances of libraries very low utilization in some very kind of impoverished, challenged communities. It's a resource, but nobody's going there, and there's a reason for that. So really setting some clear strategic priorities for the entire system, that will help, hopefully trickle down to all of the libraries so that they can be galvanized to be uh, really plugged in in the way that many are, but all are not, I think would be important. Well, how do you solve that? I mean, that was one of the most frustrating things to see as part of, from the research point of view, that, that some of the kind of most challenged communities in the city that actually have fairly low rates of, of user, user, uh, users at the libraries. And so I'm just curious, like, you know, is it a matter of outreach? Is it, is it just, um, how do we get, is it more partnerships? How do we bring up the, the rates of use in, in, in some, of, some of the libraries where we don't see uh, huge numbers already? I'm sure everything that you just said is on that list and probably some other things, but I think it's, it's incumbent on the system because, you know, they are making an investment in those communities in terms of capital, human capital, and everything else. That's not reaping a return. So really drilling down and, and why is this happening in communities where there is a huge need for lots of whatever is going on in that building, wh where's the mismatch? Is it marketing and, and kind of communication strategy, or is it that they're not real programs that are, are addressing the needs, or it can be a number of things, but that's an important thing to, to investigate. We are really, um, you know, um, lucky to have uh, the presidents of all three library systems here, Tony, Linda, and Tom. And, um, and I'm just curious, before we open it up to questions from the audience, um, you know, are, are, there, are there any pieces of advice you all have? I mean, clearly the report <laughs> talks about the many amazing things that libraries are doing. Um, we've certainly kind of put out there that, you know, there's a strong case to be made that they could certainly benefit from more, more city funding and support. But I also think that it would be helpful for them to hear if there are other things that they should be doing, not just among advocacy, but anything to kind of deal with some of the human capital challenges. We know they're already doing so much. Any advice for the three of them and their staffs uh, for anybody on the panel today? I do, I do, I do actually. <laughs> so we're all being shy here, but because um, you know we all have ideas, right? <laughs> um, I actually want to talk about the high school equivalency exam um, and the reality that this January um, the, the um, landscape will look very different for individuals who have disconnected from education and will need some form of a high school equivalency and it's a, it's a large population of people. And I think, you know, Sheena talks about, um, just mentioned these sites that might not be um, utilized well enough. We, we, we are going to have a challenge, a real challenge on our hands. We already have a real challenge on our hands and I think about how how, does, how do libraries, or how can libraries continue to be that first place of entry of reconnecting? And I know this was something that um, we tested from the um, Center for Economic Opportunity with some library systems, and it worked. Um, I think it, it has to be um, a place where we reconnect young people um, and any individual who would like to sort of see themselves um, get this degree, and I think the pre-GED um, requirements right now are so critical and so from a sort of turnkey quick um, response from the city's benefit economically speaking we cannot afford to not have a population of individuals who fundamentally are ready to take this exam or need want to take this exam to not get the um, literacy skills or testing skills that they need um, to be able to take that before January and as it becomes computer-based, that becomes exactly. really critical because a lot of the organizations that work with young people, they don't have access to computers. Uh, but it's interesting because as people were speaking, I, I, I really feel like one of the things that I keep thinking about is, and I, I'm of two minds of this, you know, when Beacons came out in the early 90s, the plea was around safety, right? And now I think the plea is around kind of building the competency of, of young people to really thrive in this economy. 
And so there's some triaging that's required still, like some basic skill development that I think the libraries need to be a part of, specifically on the pre-GD and GED level and the pathways. But also, I, I think that I keep going back to what you were saying about this idea of innovation, so that they don't be, they're not at risk at becoming only accountable for academic outcomes, because that would be what a lot of CBOs are struggling with at this moment. Like, so tell us, how, how, how are they graduation rates? That's not what we rate. That's not what we put into this instrument or this machine. So I feel like figuring out how to straddle this idea of being responsive to kind of the, the lack of skills and educational outcomes that young people need to thrive, but also to continue to be innovative and not be pigeonholed as kind of um, taking up for what school systems aren't doing. Chris and Sandra and really anybody on the panel, one of the things when you're talking about the youth population we, we saw in our research is that, that all of the libraries are really doing a lot more with kind of specific teen rooms. Um, is that a direction we need to be going in and, and are there other things to, to appeal to, to the youth and, and young adult population that libraries should be doing more of? I mean, I, I would say quickly, I think teen rooms are one strategy, but I think this idea of intergenerational programming is really critical because I think that these populations become very siloed. So similar to what community-based organizations is figuring out how you connect young adults with, with seniors, for example. How do you develop programming where there's an arch and that there's this kind of mutual kind of aid or dependency rather than thinking about team programming or senior programming, thinking about what is the, the collective impact of this community and how we build that? I think some of it, and I agree, definitely agree, uh, teen rooms are great, and I think there's some great models out there. U Media in Chicago is doing some interesting things with how do you make teen-friendly spaces but in libraries. But um, I also think it's about, so we sometimes pigeonhole audiences, well, seven-year-olds like this, and That's teenagers right. like this, and seniors like this. I think we just have to be more livable spaces within libraries where some of these sort of old uh, stereotypes about libraries sort of wash away and I think the intergenerational aspect because people are people right they like places they can talk they like places they can they can be together they can group where there's mentorship or expertise that, that can be accessed I think what's going on at Brooklyn Public Library with the information Commons space it just opened a couple months ago super interesting um, and I think it's something to watch and look at but I think you know if, if we think of libraries in these kind of community center approach then it's it's actually what what kind of activities go on there and what's supported from a sort of social emotional standpoint will be a real, real interesting um, way forward. And I think in the educational space, I'm just going to plus one, you know, the, the, if the advice, so to speak, would be to be brave in terms of about thinking of yourselves as a place to, to push forth educational alternatives and not just That's double right. down on Common Core and, and some of the, you know, it's not, it's not school plus, it's not school extra, you know, there's, right. there's other, there's other, you know, you own a space in which things can be tried and which isn't school and I think there's, there's a real ownership of that that's an opportunity space. Great. We have questions from the audience. We have a microphone over here. Anybody have a question? Okay, yes. The, um, I was having this conversation with uh, <coughs> David Van Zandt, the president of uh, New School in Parsons, and how uh, New York City, is, as you know, is competing with Silicon Valley at this point. And what distinguishes New York City is uh, the design factor and the creative side uh, that as technology moves away from developing the basic technology to its application in key industries, there's a terrific opportunity where there's real synergies with the arts. And I would think that thinking backwards from kind of that end game would be, would be useful and that what we were talking about was how institutions like Parsons play a conscious role in that, in that area. FIT, the Fashion Institute for Technology, is a is another one that's very consciously working in those areas. So I think for arts funders, I would be thinking about that dynamic. Yeah, I would, I think, I would totally agree. I mean, from, 
I, we so much, in, this is something we try to help people think, rethink and hide, but we think so much of these things as siloed content areas too often and, and back to the workforce thing, then they get into the workforce and you have to be all of these things all the time, especially in the tech workforce, mm -hmm. especially when you think about where the United States is places in a, in a sort of STEM career. It's not in building data, you know, it's not in all these sort of IT-ish type of things. It really is in that intersection of technology design, entrepreneurship and leadership. So I think I, I, I really hesitate on separating those out, art and technology generally. And some of the most innovative stuff is by people coming from programs like Parsons or NY, um, NYU's ITP program where, you know, these are, these are the mar marvelous, whimsical, practical kind of, you know, mutants of technology and art. Where actually a lot of artists are actually, you know, going into that space or finding inspiration from and all kinds of examples throughout the city of where that what science, what's art, and what's technology are, you know, even for expertise, hard to parse. Can I also just add that, you know, I think the report alludes to this, that libraries are places where um, freelancers or independent, you know, individuals who, you know, are employed sort of find space. And I think, you know, emerging artists can be found across the city in lots of ways. And so does the, does the library become a space that can actually exhibit new artists' work? local community artist work? Does it become a place where that local artist then gives back and runs a workshop for, for children or does a programming, you know, some sort of, of it offset some of your programming opportunities? Um, so it, it seems like there are ways that I imagine a funder can help support some of the activities but also the, you know, driving more people into a space while adding to um, the um, professional landscape of the, of the city and the community. Yes. Great question. Any I think thoughts? The, the um, co-location with the Workforce One Center, the Workforce One Center that specializes in industry and transportation, is a great example. I think the more connectivity there is between real jobs placement activity, and I think the city has taken leadership now in job placement and, and looking backwards at how to how to connect that to adequate job preparation. Um, I don't think there's as close a connection with industry as there should be and that that piece is missing and perhaps the libraries could be a vehicle for facilitating that and then working with the Workforce One centers. There are now, what, 18 of them? Something like something that? Something like that. Um, but, I think that, but I think that's an opportunity. The, the, I mean, the workforce development system in the city is, is not a system. And <laughs> hopefully that's increasingly going to be a priority. And I think right now is very good timing for positioning the library as an institution in the evolution of workforce development away from these fragmented, one-off, boutique not very effective programs into a much uh, more sustained and um, sustainable uh, system, and it's it's just it's good timing for that. Can you all talk about some thoughts on how do you get libraries to more engaged in these communities? And, you know, 
the question of leadership at these libraries in terms of vision and uh, you know, rather than just sort of you know, being sort of, sort of gated, uh, what, how do we get out there and engage people? I actually, I want, I want to respond to the question before yours, before we move into the engagement question. Um, I think um, uh, I'll speak broadly, but I, I think just from the perspective of, of immigrant New Yorkers, we actually have a large population, population of high-skilled immigrants who come and are working in any number of jobs that um, if we provide them some opportunity, I think, to connect largely to English language skills in some instances or, or to create a larger network, we can pipeline people into um, more robust opportunities. But I'd say the same if you're talking about um, maintenance or other jobs. In English language acquisition is really critical. And I think the report talks about this, but every single library is providing services in this arena one, they're not getting access to a larger state pool of funding, but in addition to that, they're all, they all have waiting lists. And so um, this is really critical. This is a very critical conversation. I think we in the state need to have. Um, I think the conversation of whether these are seen as educational institutions or not is another one. Um, but there's a population of people who can work in this space, who would like to work in this space, but need a fundamental, um, a fundamental skill to work in this place. Contextualized English is very important, right? So someone working in the maintenance field has to know certain mm -hmm. things to be able to navigate that space pretty well. Um, but I just want to just add to that because I think that that's actually pretty important. On your engagement question, I'll let my colleagues jump in. Mm -hmm. I, I think I wanted to just add to that as well. I think that one of the things about access to the kind of to jobs in the workforce is really critical. But again, specifically with older youth, community-based organizations have been struggling with this about the kind of the pathways. What are the pathways? And I think there needs to be an equal emphasis on the preparation, right? So that uh, when those jobs are available, young people aren't necessarily prepared, and so they go in for a few months and then they kind of drop out. But this issue of, of kind of community engagement, I think that partnering, there are 80 beacons in New York City. I think partnering with beacons, beacons have been around since 1991. They've been really uh, kind of skilled in being able to compete with local <coughs> gangs and other youth serving organizations that have popped up because they really uh, kind of understand youth engagement as kind of membership and belonging, safety and structure, and really uh, kind of being outside of the walls of the beacon. So there's one beacon in, in Sunset Park that recruits people by going into playgrounds and places where nobody else wants to be. So I think similarly, um, libraries have to think about the same strategies, moving beyond the walls and thinking about the key people in communities, whether it be CBO leaders, whether it be young people, who can help bridge those gaps. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I think there is a market. Thank you. Other questions? In the back. changing the nature of their partnerships and looking to other models to 
to really, um, first of all, make infrastructure more lightweight so you can put more money into programming. So if you, if you make your infrastructure lightweight, you can put all those resources not just into maintenance, but into delivering on the mission of what you want to deliver on. What about some thoughts around that? Do you see new models emerging here and elsewhere? I think the example, the Bronx Center model, that maybe the library panel that comes next can talk about, because to me, I think you're absolutely right that the <coughs> investing in the programs is going to require an, some efficiencies in the infrastructure that don't exist right now, and that's uh, evolution. I'd be interested in the utilization demographic of the patrons of the Bronx Library Center. I know it's high, but where are those people coming from? In some cases, may they be coming from communities where people aren't using their uh, little community library, but are attracted to the technology and the other services available in the centralized unit. And I would think a utilization study, if you didn't, if it's not done, would be helpful in understanding that. Because I think you're right. I think that's, I believe that's the future. Competing relentlessly for a shrinking pie of resources is not what I would recommend where energies go. Other thoughts on the panel on the question? Any, anybody else? No? Well, I mean, there's, I mean, I, we spoke, we sort of were teasing it out earlier around the space, you know. I mean, there's all kinds of models out there and business, you know, with, you know, almost what's the Airbnb for unused uh, library space? Um, or, you know, I mean, or the, you know, let your computer, you know, look for alien life forms while you're not using it. I mean, there's all kinds of, I'm forgetting the business model name approach, but I mean, yeah, but, the, you know, I think there's, there's, these are huge buildings and infrastructures that, you know, generally go unused for lots of things at lots of times. And there's, a, you know, I mean, those are business models and, and things that people are starting to recognize in society. Um, and I don't, I don't think it would be a big leap for some of those to be teased out within these infrastructures. Great. And I, I would just add to that, I mean, it, I think that's a, an amazing uh, point and, and a huge opportunity. Many of the libraries, right, are 100 years old, these buildings. And, you know, one of the things that was highlighted in the report was kind of the deferred maintenance and the real challenge of these really old buildings, um, really maintaining them. <coughs> so they, they're going to have to be there's going to have to be some investment and just in order to keep them open um, if, if they, you know, live past their useful life of a number of things and to be really innovative and creative and use this as, a, as, a, as an opportunity to be, you know, to compete, you know, for being innovative, being in that space and place, to lowering the cost of running these 100-year-old buildings. I think it's a great, great opportunity and a great point. Thanks. Councilman? So I want to ask kind of a big hard question about libraries as public-private institutions that I'm interested in the next panel's answer on, but I guess I'm also interested in sort of Kathy and, uh, and Fatima's uh, answer to, because it seems to me there's just a big disconnect. We want it to be, we want the libraries to be these community service centers to be able to integrate a whole array of public uh, services and programs in a, in a different way, and I thought the list you gave was was great. Um, and that would speak to recognizing them as uh, public infrastructure in a much more fundamental way than we do, and not having this fundamental withdrawal of resources, which is what we've done over the recent years, but an investment of resources and figuring out the infrastructure and the footprint questions together as part of public infrastructure decision making. On the other hand, we're inspired by them as nonprofits and want them yeah. to compete and raise mm -hmm. private money. And, Yet it seems to me we've left them in this uh, very poor middle space in between mm -hmm. those two things. And that we can't decide, are they fundamental public infrastructure, in which case they would be somewhat more part of the city and we wouldn't divest responsibility for funding them in quite the way we have. Or are they nonprofit institutions mm -hmm. uh, that are supposed to partner with government but aren't government? And I feel a little bit like um, being stuck in this slightly confused space it's got some great advantages, and it has some terrible worst of both worlds, uh, both on the public funding side, on the land use decision making side, on the what kind of programs to locate their side. Are they partners with government or are they government? 
Um, and maybe that's great and it's wonderful that they're in this sort of nether space and there's a lot of opportunities there. But I also feel like for the big changes it sounds like we want on both funding and, and footprint, um, it is sometimes a challenging one. And I wonder. Great question. Well, uh, I certainly want to hear what the library presidents say in the next <laughs> panel, but, um, but let me, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious if, if anybody has a, has a thought, uh, because, I mean, I think clearly that came up in our research, Brad, that, um, you know, um, I think one of the challenges, and I don't want to speak for the, the presidents that are here, the library presidents, but I think that in some ways a lot of people, and not just individuals, um, I think take it for granted that libraries are government, and so maybe there's not as much of an inclination to support them privately or, or whatever. So um, it's sort of like a public and a private side answer or thoughts before we set up them who is sort of in the middle to... to mm -hmm. any, any thoughts? So, so I'll start by saying I think that the, the value that they are not-for-profits are really critical um, because I think um, the reason they are such safe spaces in many instances, certainly for many communities, is because they aren't government. I actually do see them very much as an extension of our ability to work better with communities. Um, I think that they are able to co connect to communities, um, obviously by, by way of their presence, physical presence, but also because of what they do and what they offer. Um, I will say, you know, the city has a number of relationships with these um, entities that are quasi government. Um, think of business improvement districts and the fact that bids across the city get some, you know, sort of funding through um, city um, agent through the Department of Small Business Services to help, you know, renovate communities or neighborhoods and business improve, you know, sort of do that kind of work. You know, do libraries fall within that arena, right? Should they fall within that arena? Do they become, you know, a sort of um, steady stream of funding? We give out contracts to CBOs across the city to help us provide English language instruct instruction and do job training. You know, do they then pick in on that kind of stuff? Do we create smarter opportunities so that they are homes to Workforce One centers or business solution centers? Or, I mean, I think there's opportunity there, but I do think the um, integrity of the fact that they are um, not-for-profits and in many ways um, the first line of, of opportunity for a, an, an individual from a neighborhood to walk in um, without fear of government is pretty important. Though I think we have to be mindful in government to make sure that we're treating and serving people um, wonderfully and well. I, I do think these um, entities help us do that. Um, they're not different from the SIG institutions either, really. <laughs> they're part of a network of public-private partnerships. Um, and I think there is some value in that, but what we've lost is we've, we've allowed those to all become sort of turf conscious or, or proprietary turf interest institutions. And we don't have any planning and coordination and function and um, that drives, um, drives the agenda and drives funding. And I think because these institutions are so dependent on public funding, that capacity has to be created. And it's, it doesn't exist. Um, it exists in a totally uh, backwards, convoluted way in the budget process. Um, and so I would say that you point to the need to create a centralized planning function that would include both representation of the not-for-profit side, but also representation of government and civic interests, broader civic interests that can say how, what are the priorities we're looking for from the libraries, how do you plug it into the overall stream of services. And I, I was talking before about the collective impact model that everybody's looking at for how we get more efficient, better utilization of all the various streams of publicly funded services going into neighborhoods. And I think libraries stand to net benefit from that conversation, because I think now they're really at the margins, um, as, as you said, in terms of funding priorities, and I, I think it could only be good for them. But it's got a, it's it's a it's an exercise that we don't have any way to carry out right now. And I think some some good examples. I mean, the one that was just given, comparing them to parks. So government sees parks as public spaces, public infrastructure, but you know you have the Central Park Conservancy, and they have a they can raise funds um, privately to do lots of other innovative things. 
but that real ownership and, and of this real investment of government in these spaces and appreciating the import of it is something that needs to be heightened in terms of our libraries that exist in other places where I'm sure there's a lot of advantages and be benefits for being in that in-between space, but that, that government support probably has not been as strong for some of these it, when you compare it to others. And there's some examples we can look at to really learn from, I think, to mm -hmm. strengthen the investment. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Yes? I think the quick answer is yes. Yes. Right? <laughs> like I, think, I think we've all, I mean, it's a colleague of yours, if not you, is quoted in here about the fact that um, the mere presence of Workforce One centers is now driving in a new audience of folks that hasn't ever really appeared in Workforce One centers, right? So I think the reality is, is you're going to get an audience who may, there are folks who know about Workforce One centers and there are folks who don't, right? And I think that. Um, as much, as, as much marketing that can be done around the value of a library and what happens in a library, the value add is if there is, in fact, information about skills building programs and, in fact, programming on how to get those skills, um, those job training skills, then I think it's that much more valuable. So I think the short answer is yes, right? And I think the, the point about industry partnerships that I was trying to make is work, a few of the Workforce One centers have more robust partnerships than others. But overall, we don't have a workforce development system that effectively connects industry in all phases of consulting on the job preparation, the training, the criteria, the credentialing. That does not exist. And I think the um, Workforce One centers have got, done a good job as a first step in placement. But I think we need a much more robust system, much more integration with the education system, and I think the libraries can be a part of making that happen. All right, with that, thank you very much to the panel. Please join me. Yay.